eight o'clock lecture. Mr. Glenn E. McCaskey, Vice President and Director of Environmental Management for Sea Pines Company, is replacing Mr. Charles Fraser, who is listed on your program. Mr. McCaskey received an MA from the Annenberg School of Communications, University of Pennsylvania. His undergraduate studies were at the College of William and Mary. He is the author of numerous articles on tourism and has served in numerous capacities for the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation in Virginia. He will talk on opportunities and obstacles for the leisure industry. Mr. Glenn E. McCaskey. Just uh, add another uh, message in minutes until Mr. McCaskey arrives. He has been associated with that Sea Pines and the uh, Amelia Island, is that correct? Yes. A project, and uh, we'll discuss that with us for a few moments until Mr. McCaskey's arrival. And we'll tell him to change his watch when he gets here. Mr. Patrick Hosbrow. Ladies and gentlemen, I know some of the difficulties which confront organizers on occasions of this sort, and therefore um, my heart bleeds for you, and I wonder if I might impose on you for a few minutes uh, simply to improvise with respect to the subject which uh, Glenn McCaskey is going to uh, discuss this evening, planning, building, and operating resorts and other recreational facilities. And the reason why I'm uh, emboldened to seize this opportunity is to tell you something, if I can, of the background, which has been my privilege uh, to work with uh, Glenn McCaskey from time to time because uh, with four others whose names may be familiar to you, under the chairmanship of Grady Clay, uh, the uh, renowned editor of Landscape Architecture Quarterly, I served periodically on uh, an advisory planning council of Amelia Island, which is the northernmost island of the whole chain of uh, protective sand dunes, uh, which uh, fringe uh, the east coast of these United States. Now, I'm particularly concerned with island design and island welfare uh, because I am passionately addicted to islands. There is something uh, about the spirit of an island. An island has some kind of uh, self-containment. If you can appreciate, if you can assess the qualities of an island, and then, for God's sake, leave it alone. You will be uh, serving uh, mankind and the uh, uh, planning uh, developments of this nation in a greater way, possibly, than you might imagine. And I would like to pay uh, tribute uh, to the work of the Sea Pines uh, Company and the Sea Pines Plantation, because in my estimation, in traveling fairly extensively in this country and in Canada, I can assure you that I know of no organization which has the experience and the sensitivities and the planning policies of the quality which uh, Glenn McCaskey will now be able to uh, convey to you in further detail. And now that I am here, Glenn, if I may um, 
impose on you and uh, interject uh, from time to time if I think that you may be letting slip or not making clear any of the details with which uh, I've recently had the privilege of being concerned. But just before I yield the microphone to you, Glenn, uh, I would like to stress this very particularly uh, because in the work of the Sea Pines Company, I am unaware of any that it has set for so long, I think it's upwards of 18 years now, uh, a standard of planning and design that is so acute. They are concerned with the interpretation of the uh, territory on a yard-by-yard -yard basis. And if you will permit me just one moment, which I was explaining to a uh, colleague upstairs, uh, with respect to the deficiency of even the English language to support the degree of planning, proficiency, and refinement which you will find in daily operation in the Sea Plains Company uh, organizations. And it is quite simply this. Most of you in this room are uh, trained or being trained as architects. Now, architecture is possibly the greatest of the arts. It has a long history, it is inherited, and therefore you have the privilege of being trained in architecture. But there is something I think that we share, uh, Glenn, that we have discovered in the Sea Pines Plantation operations, that there are occasions, particularly when you are dealing with sand, uh, to which no training will is available, certainly not in this country. And no amount of aerial photography and careful refinement and endless surveying with respect to the location of trees, the quality of trees, the, their sizes and their uh, general conditions. There comes a time when the construction plans need to be set aside and you have to get down on the site and on your hands and knees and start constructing then and there. And we have had to term this physiotecture as distinct from architecture physios of the mind. You have to think and improvise and construct then and there. And because this is the nature of sand. It is moving, it is alive, it has a design discipline all of its own. And let me assure you, and Glenn will support this, that there are times when architecture simply won't do, it is not enough. These are the kind of pioneering exploratory refinements which you will find at uh, the Sea Pines uh, Company's uh, operations, both at Hilton Head and at Amelia Island. And with that, if I may uh, impose upon you and uh, present to you a very much revered and respected colleague, Glenn McCaskey. Thank you, Patrick. The uh, unfortunate, as I walked in the, in the door, I heard the words sea pines efficiency being mentioned, and you went on to say it again two or three times, and under the circumstances, I am very embarrassed. Uh, I guess this teaches me not to make uh, two Midwest trips in, in one week. I was dead to the world back in the student center. Uh, uh, I guess it's been too interesting a day. It has been an awful lot to absorb in, in uh, a short period of time. And I, for one, have gotten a great deal out of this conference. I've been, uh, usually when I go through conferences, I love to write down favorite quotes uh, or catchphrases that come out from some of the speakers. And I'd like to share a couple of my notes with you and not try to, uh, while not trying to, uh, undo the, the wrap-up for tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Scruton came up with my favorite one so far. It is, leisure is the mother of invention, not necessity. And I think there's, when you think about that, there's a lot of truth to it. Dr. Edmonds had a good thrust. He said that the purest theories of leisure are basically for the birds because they're always being fouled up by all the other things that are going on in the world. And I think that's the way we need to look at leisure. It fits into a much larger system. It's, it's not unto itself just the way architecture or no particular discipline is. It's a part of the whole. I was fascinated by Dr. Burton's work uh, in Canada. Uh, the further I get along in the business world, the lower opinion I 
generally uh, have been developing over the role of, gov of government in society, and I find that his work in Canada is, is really the, the positive sort of dynamic uh, thrust and leadership that I think we expect from government. Um, Jeffrey Broadbent said that uh, because everything seems to have become the same, there's a great interest in difference again. And this has very significant ramifications for the, the leisure industry, for the field of architecture. And I like uh, Linda Kandel's uh, metaphor saying that Club Mediterranean is waging war against cement, against formality, and against high rise. Uh, I think all these are very important uh, aspects of the industry, and I think very good analyses. Ours is a very special industry. Our services, and we're, in a, we're a service business in both the architecture and the leisure industry, thank you, sir, uh, uh, primarily feature escape and diversion. Leisure businesses assist people in stepping out of their routine and giving them a break from the daily chores, whatever their chores might be. The human need for leisure, for escape, for diversion is a very old drive. It's as old as man is himself. In this age, the word leisure has, as was cited earlier this morning, taken on uh, an almost frivolous connotation, if not worse. But leisure is a great deal more than a luxury, and, and many sociologists and psychologists have been, made us aware of the fact that leisure is actually a necessity for man, uh, that the chance to escape, to be periodically diverted uh, physically and mentally is one of the requirements to good health and good interpersonal relationships. Now, the magnitude, of course, varies with each individual, but it's, it's a basic drive. And this, to me, is a, is a fascinating thing, because in this, in this space age, uh, with men walking on the moon, those of us in this room are probably sharing the same basic sorts of leisure drives that men thousands of years ago shared with us. The needs are for escape and diversion, and they're innate, they're instinctual, they're evidenced in societal patterns inherited from our forefathers. It's an important thing for, for us to realize as architects. It's an important thing for us to realize from a marketing context in the leisure industry. Now, the great human motivation for diversion and escape represents a very substantial force in the world. And whether we realize it or not, it's those of us in this room and those of us involved in the leisure industry that are going to be directing this force. We're going to be exploiting it as well. Uh, and we should be managing it. And as, as a result, we should have uh, some means by which we're called into account for our success or failure in managing the resources of the leisure industry. This evening, I'm going to talk about uh, th this force. I'm going to talk about uh, the opportunity that it holds for the leisure industry, the, some problems that we have in realizing that opportunity, and an ultimate responsibility. Now, earlier today, we heard about the General Motors uh, home. We heard about uh, Club Mediterranean. So how in the world do does, does leisure, as, a, uh, as evidence of an ancient drive in man, uh, correlate with these? Uh, historically, as of 5,000 years ago or five minutes ago, the leisure activity-seeking individual usually focused on refuge in one of two categories. The two categories are cultural refuge, as Dr. Scruton outlined, or escape to natural environments. Some people, de Grazia, for example, make a case for a third category of leisure, and that is uh, sports pursuits. But most folks consider uh, the sports kind of diversion as either a throwback to uh, cultural uh, bases or environmental bases when the hunt was death. So I'll focus on, on cultural and natural elements of leisure tonight. Culturally, man has always been a, uh, a creature of tradition. He's always held the accomplishments of preceding generations, usually several generations removed, uh, in awe. He's talked to the good old days. 
He's always pursued his own personal heritage, his own lineage. This is even more so probably in, in this 20th century world when people feel that their very identity is being threatened and they're looking for roots, they're looking for heritage, they're looking for the security that comes with knowing that, that previous generations have uh, faced problems of knowing that they either have or have not solved them and that yet somehow they've survived. A uh, contemporary search for identity goes on in each age. Uh, this generation is doing its own thing. That's, that's a search for identity. Uh, as we know, music, theater, art, architecture, and fashions are all important cultural indicators which have very signif significant ramifications for the uh, leisure industry. But so are amusement parks, those of Atlantic City, uh, those of uh, the Disney World, and even those of the Atlanta Omni Center of tomorrow. Uh, the hotels, the, the grand hotels of a generation ago, the motels and hotels of today are cultural indicators within the leisure industry. From the escape to nature standpoint, the historic pattern is very much the same. Today's basic uh, drives in this direction are captured by the catchphrase back to nature and there's a, there's a back to nature element in each uh, in each one of us and it's evidenced in a, in a whole raft of contemporary industries uh, such as sports camping uh, gardening hunting fishing bicycling visiting national parks boating off-the-road vehicles these are all back to nature uh, types of industries in our contemporary lives. Now on Hilton Head Island, two generations ago, women went swimming on our beautiful beaches in skirts and pantaloons. Today they swim in string bikinis. Uh, lithographs from 1586 on the island show Indians swimming in the buff. So perhaps fashion's coming full cycle. Uh, but fashions change, but the, the salient point here is that the leisure drive, the back to nature drive of going for a swim in the ocean uh, hasn't changed. Very often the satisfaction of our cultural and environmental drives might be intermixed in, in two industries known as leisure industry or known as tourism. But the basic urges uh, are always separately definable if you have a look at it. A vacation trip to Eastern Virginia, for instance, might take you to Williamsburg for uh, cultural, historical types of experiences. You might go from there to Virginia Beach for environmental experiences in the beach. From there you might go up to Washington and visit the White House, culture. You might visit the House of Representatives, botanical gardens, nature. So it flip-flops back and forth in sports Tennis, golf, and all the rest fit in there, and you could put that in whatever category uh, you like. So, what is our leisure business? It is not the manufacture of motorhomes. It's not the manufacture of boats, of uh, tour packages, sporting equipment. It's not even the sale of second homes in South Carolina, as sacred as that is to me. Uh, our business is providing access to desirable natural and cultural environments. The things we produce are the prices that people are willing to pay to obtain access to the environments that we control. The things change over time, but the basic drives remain the same, and but it's by looking at those basic drives that we can best understand the business that we're in. Now, as an example, conventionally my company appears to be in two businesses, land development and resort operations. But that's not it at all. We're in the business of owning about 60 miles of shoreline in the southeastern portion of the United States and Puerto Rico that's highly desirable. We're in the business of providing varying degrees of access to those natural and cultural environments of the shoreline and collecting access fees. For one kind of permanent access, we realize an income from selling villas and homes. For another kind of access, we realize an income from selling lots on which people can build homes. For a third kind of access, a briefer, less permanent type, we'll rent a hotel room or a motel room, we'll sell meals in the restaurants, we'll rent floats on the beach, rent fishing gear, boats, and all the other means of experiencing the environment. 
sometimes to add to the existing experience and generate more access demand, we'll add a few new escape back to nature or cultural mechanisms, such as tennis courts and golf courses, or we'll build hiking trails, equestrian trails uh, through the woods. But again, our basic business orientation is providing people with experiences, either natural or cultural, that are critical parts of their most ancient inner drives. We then sell them something that they need in order to have access to those experiences, be it a hotel room or second home, uh, airplane ticket, snowshoes, uh, sailboat, hang glider, uh, glider glider, what, what have you. All these are the things, uh, the, the prices people are willing to pay for access. So, just as the means of satisfying man's basic leisure drives change from age to age, so do the degrees to satisfy, the, so does the need to satisfy these urges change. And that herein lies a tremendous opportunity for the leisure industry in 1975. The legitimate, compelling need and demand for escape to nature and diversion uh, to culture, types of experiences have probably never been higher in all history than they are at this very moment. Problems of international war in the Middle East, of starvation in Africa, of inflation, and of a declining quality of life all around us are touching almost every living person in a very direct way. In this country over the past decade, our culture has changed rather dramatically. Also, our conscious attitudes towards the natural environment have changed, and in doing so have changed the nature of our leisure markets. These changes results in, in, uh, are the results of a, of a whole host of things, and they go well beyond the headlines of this particular year. They include the, the entire basic question of the rural-urban transfer of the population. They include the unmanageability of most urban areas in excess of two million residents, uh, the arrival at maturity of the World War II baby boom, and the polluting side effects of a runaway industrial growth that, uh, on top of everything else, has created a certain new level of dehumanization and, and mundaneness of work for uh, probably an over-educated population. One of the results of the convergence of these unparalleled forces in history is that a great deal has been lost in the shuffle. Because of urbanization, significant portions of the population have had to alter their sense of space. Architects, I think, probably understand that better than anybody. Because of the problems of urbanization and over-industrialization, like increased crime and the use of drugs, a new fearful perception of the contemporary man-made world pervades in the places where the majority of Americans live. Because of the emergence of the mass media and the way we use it, an important human-to-human -human relationship has been lost in society and between people. And because of the Western system of accounting for goods and the fact that it has a single expressed purpose of increasing production and material wealth, we individuals and society have lost uh, a great many of our irreplaceable natural and cultural resources. Today, there are more consumer-aged, affluent people living under conditions of stress, fear, crowdedness, and frustration and pollution than ever before. History tells us unmistakably what the human reaction is to such conditions. Human beings seek solace in cultural diversion and escape to nature, the leisure industry. The demand for diversion and escape for leisure industry experiences has got to greatly expand during the rest of this decade. Momentary economic conditions will determine the type of consumer patterns but it will not alter the existing demand one iota. We have a potential for a boom in this industry the like of which we've never seen before, as sad as, as the reasons behind it might be. However, there are a few obstacles that are going to keep most of us in this room and most of us in the leisure industry 
from either seeing the opportunity that's sitting on the table in front of us or capitalizing upon it. It's a sad thing because the need is, is so substantial and, and the potential benefit is quite great as well. But even so, there's only a very enlightened few of us, if, if we continue the way we are, that are going to actually benefit from the existing and growing potential. There are three barriers keeping us from realizing the opportunities awaiting the leisure industry. The first is basically what I've been talking about thus far, and that is the perspective of what business we're in. This lack of perspective results in non-attention to the resources that are critical to the well-being of our industry. Secondly, and it's related, uh, the business world as a whole has lost the societal burden of doing something right for the sake of it. That burden has shifted to government to keep us from doing something wrong as opposed to remaining with the private sector, which should be doing it right in the first place. We'll get back to that. Uh, that's rather controversial. Thirdly, the economic system of Western society has evolved into a very unbalanced measuring device, which almost alone judges the actions of men and the performance of industry. Yet, econ economics is unable to weigh the value of the cultural and environmental qualities, which are the crux of our business, as well as the safety valve to mankind. First, let's look at this perspective issue. We, there can be no argument that we lack perspective in this industry. We not only stand back while mindless highway departments plow ahead un, unhindered through the old sections of our towns and destroy cultural and environmental uh, resources, uh, but we also stand by and watch uh, the, the oil industry uh, begin exploitation on the East Coast and continue oil drilling in the Gulf and on the West Coast when in, inadequate environmental protection measures are being taken. That kind of in industry act, action is at a very direct expense of the uh, leisure industry because the coastal environmental resource is absolutely critical to the well-being of our, our large industry. A lot of the mistakes, that, a lot of the unfortunate things that are happening are a result of our own effort, inadequate planning, uh, taking shortcuts, and not supporting those who would preserve our critical resources for us. The Georgia Heritage Trust Program, as we heard just before dinner, is uh, addressing that issue. If our industry is to be healthy with a long-term future, this lack of perspective has simply got to change. If we were to perceive that the basic drives behind leisure today are those of ancient history and predictably cultural and environmental, we'd have a much easier time of seeing a subsequent responsibility and to direct and manage the resources of the industry with some intelligence, if, with, if for no other reason, for our own vested interest in them. You know, people don't buy beach floats to use in polluted swimming waters, nor do boats sell very well to go on rivers that uh, smell foul or the air smells foul over them. We know that game equipment sales drop where there are fewer parks. The, tra the tourist travel industry knows that uh, hotel rooms, meals, tour packages, and other services go begging in, in tourist areas that become overdeveloped or, or end up with that terrible spoiled image. Uh, vital nature-oriented experiences and important cultural assets of society are valuable to us as they are with access, yet our, our industry continues to let them be damaged without raising up a, a hand to defend itself. The vested interest in, in these resources is still not appreciated. It isn't much comfort, but the loss of perspective within the leisure industry is accompanied by similar losses in most areas of business. For years, heavy industry has managed to convince themselves that they have no responsibility towards the natural environment or even to avoid the wrath of people who feel otherwise. Uh, this is changing. Uh, in, 
particularly in the, in the area of the natural environment. But the consequences have been severe. The uh, consequences have been an, an angry outcry of public opinion to save the environment, rightfully so. This has been solidified now, and we're stuck with the consequences of it. It's been solidified into a whole host of environmentally oriented agencies at the federal and state level. Uh, it's interesting also to note that in this era of energy crisis, that opinion polls are showing that public support for this new and expensive governmental thrust to manage our environment is holding up uh, as if there were no energy crisis at all. But a dire consequence of, of these agencies uh, cannot, that cannot be over-exaggerated is that we are creating a government bureaucratic approach to problem solving in this country. We are creating layers of expensive to society, inflexible, lethargic government, which substitutes for the conscience and ethics of business. And there's good and bad government. And Dr. Burton's work, as I mentioned, uh, is a very positive thrust in, in the area of government. But the proliferation of, of regulatory agencies in this country is going to have a devastating impact on our very democratic system uh, if we don't change the, the pace at which it's being created. We'll, we'll talk about this a little more. Uh, but let's move on to the second topic here, and it's the second obstacle standing between the industry and realizing the potential in front of it. Much of our business strategy today lacks good old common sense and lacks ethics, and it creates a lot of problems for those of us in it. Much of the environmental and government regulation problem that we have today that's created these agencies could have been avoided had those companies involved uh, probably mine included, used some sense and done what was right in the first place. There's a problem in America today, and that is there's not much reason to do what is right anymore, except for the very problem I'm addressing, and that's the voiding of government regulation. For some very interesting reasons, American business has evolved into the position of wrong actions often being more acceptable than right ones of ethical, moral, and environmentally responsible actions often being counter to the successful business aspirations of the company and therefore wrong in the business context, although right in the big picture. As businessmen, we're evolving split personalities. We've got two different selves uh, who have two different standards through which we view the world. We have our nine to five self where we're uh, at work and we're trying to keep the company uh, successful and profitable and we're trying to keep food on the table for our families. Then we have the five to nine cells and we go home to the suburbs in the evening and suffer the uh, same abuses and complain about uh, the same problems of insensitive corporate management that pollutes the river uh, downtown or ruins a favorite fishing hole. Uh, obviously, there are many, many exceptions to this from a business standpoint, but I, I think this shoe uh, fits the majority of American business. It's an amazing phenomenon when you think about it. The, the result is, that the, is, is the more government problem is the result. And all the measures that government has to take to protect the, the five to nine person in us from the nine to five person in the same us. If we did what was right in the first place, we'd find a way not to degrade the quality of life around us and others, simply because doing so would be wrong. Now, I entreat you to not let the seemingly innocent naivete of, of a do-what-is-right credo keep us from devoting thought to it. Because when this country got underway uh, two dozen decades ago, there were a lot of reasons, a lot of incentives to do what was right in the first place, or simply be responsible in business. But over the years, we've been weeding those out, and we've been replacing common sense philosophies with so-called business philosophies or mandates. The now outmoded laissez-faire system continues to, to haunt us, and it's, it's a, a key part of the problem. Lingering echoes of the laissez-faire logic cause many of us in business to justify actions in business that are not right by other standards, 
and to excuse decisions that are not even wholly ethical. But just as laissez-faire is negating or at least compromising the ethical reason to do it right for a lot of people, so is the separation of church and state justifying the disregard of morality in business. Now, somewhere in history, the, the keep church and state separate dogma got transferred into to meaning keep church and business separate. So that today, for most of us, the Judeo-Christian standards are reserved for the half of our split personality that goes home to the suburbs and the cookouts in the evening. As a consequence, we've, we've separated mind from conscience for our nine-to-five selves, at least in many instances. Now, what's all that got to do with the leisure industry? It's so, it's so obvious what it has to do with the leisure industry, it's downright obscure. If, if, if we had enough vision to, to know that our business is dependent on the cultural and environmental resources of this earth, and if as businessmen we followed the same credos of decency that we expect as private citizens, we probably wouldn't have most of the problems we face today. But there's one more obstacle, and it's a nasty. Uh, in this time of recession, if, if recession is the right word, uh, we have more than one kind of economic crisis. The economy of the country is not only nearly out of control, but so is the economic system itself. We've evolved a profit morality in the western part of the world that is, in my view, directly counter to the best interest of the leisure industry. Profit and its doctrine of economics has its own set of constraints and the most highly refined set of values ever evolved by man. It poses tough competition for common sense, for Judaism, for Christianity, for doing it right in the first place. It also has a devastating impact on the ability of our industry to accurately understand our own business and the needs and demands of our markets, and which is directly counter to the supposed purpose of economics in the first place. In this present world, there are probably few words in our vocabulary as in our vocabulary of condemnation as condemning as the word uneconomic. In the business world, any functions that are uneconomic are not only undesired fix, uh, functions, they're direct indications of gross incompetency on the part of some poor, miserable human being involved. Anything that is found to be an impediment to economic growth in society is generally perceived to be shameful. People who cling to those impediments are seen as either being non-realist, fools, or, or corporate saboteurs, or at least the connotations there. As a result, it's the, the environmentalists, the culturalists, the sensitive human being in every one of us sitting here tonight is usually cast in a very defensive posture when it comes with any value, any ethic, any attitude, any emotion that's not economically defensible. Now, this is vitally important to the leisure industry because it's, because it's exactly to that portion of all human beings that this industry directly caters. What's happened is that economics, as a tool of society, and, and one measuring technique available to decision-making, has become much more than a means towards managing our world and developing a desirable standard of living. Economics has, has become an end unto itself. Larger questions of, of whether something is worthwhile or not, whether it's, it's right or wrong, are, are taken into consideration less and less. An example is, is matters of environmental impact at this point in time in history. Uh, environmental impact today is usually taken into consideration uh, as a result of avoiding the, the ramifications of government bureaucracy or avoiding the, uh, the ramifications of, of activists. Uh, beautiful Vista's uh, architects are uh, perceived in the narrow sense of how many views per acre can be manufactured through high-rise buildings. Uh, considerations of quaint old buildings in towns and cities are not weighed on the retention of cultural heritage as much as they're weighed on square foot 
potential for commercial use. The quality of life, you know, it's measured by the gross national product, whatever that is, and, and on it goes. So it's the lack of proper perspective on our product and the loss of what I call religious-based morality being joined by the distorted role of profit in our society that are the three tough problems that face us today. Profit has unmistakably become the, the single most important objective of, of the Western world, and this, this country in particular. Older objectives like truth, knowledge, grace, peace are now being uh, taking on connotations of the romantic notions of a few, even though they're the same vital ingredients uh, that, that are the urges, that are the, the pursued qualities that our market is after in the leisure industry. Profits become the measure of success or failure in life, not only business. It's become a consuming religion for many of us, and more than anything else, it's the deified role of profit in our society that's brought down the weight of government on our shoulders and, and it's creating the severe regulatory problems that we've got. So what do we do about it? It's not, you know, this is not a hopeless situation. There, there are solutions. Generations before us have faced tough problems and they've survived. I've got a couple of recommendations about how we deal with this one. Uh, there are two categories. One deals with a, a, a longer-term benefit, the other with the more immediate matter of market and demand identification, which can be very, very useful to us. First, as far as the basic problem is concerned, there's a very good way to put both the question of morality and profit in their proper perspective. Unfortunately, it calls for following an approach that is almost unspeakable in business circles today, as well as student circles and, and, and many other circles of society. It means applying the teachings of Moses and Jesus Christ to our everyday lives, and that includes business. It means, in other words, reintroducing a religious morality to business. Now, if you think that's not salient, as I imagine a lot of you are, just imagine how small our government regulatory agencies would be today if we did unto one another for business and profit as we would have people do unto us for business and profit. Would we? <laughs> You know, if you, you, could, you could spend an evening on that question alone. Uh, you know, would we pay exploitive wages uh, whenever we can get away with it? Would we, uh, would we land developers? And in my industry, be as prone to lock out uh, locals from their traditional recreation areas just because we were able to, to buy uh, an island uh, in, in the neighborhood? Would we in the tourism industry be as likely to put up uh, ugly modern motels next to historic uh, shrines? Would other industries be as inclined to pollute the waters that are critical to our industry if, if we had a, a, a credo like that? Trouble is that our defense mechanisms uh, in business today insulate us from asking those sorts of questions. When we ask them, it's normally because we want to avoid government or we want to avoid uh, the, the burden of activists uh, on our necks. The, the unwritten rule of separation of church and business endures even above conscience and even above what our faiths commend to us in our, in our good old five to nine selves and the effort and the time involved. Now, as to the second recommendation, we've also got to change profit as the only perception of our world and change the deification of economics as the single telescope through which we view what's going on in the world. We've got the ability to do this uh, by expanding our business perspective to incorporate a more accurate understanding of marketing demands. Now, all we have to do is do it. But it means that we've got to get hold of the unwieldy economic monster that forces the leisure industry to make wrong decisions about its own products. It's generally asserted that you can't quantify most of the qualitative experiences which just so happen to be the very lifeblood of our industry. That means that no value can be placed on experiences like walking on the beach, gazing at a, at a beautiful view, enjoying old parts of town, catching a fish, uh, just getting away from it all into the peace and quiet of a special place. 
But to the purest economist or the purest ecologist, that might be so. But to those of us that are in the middle, that are trying to apply common sense and energy to seeing how we might resolve some of these problems, which are really business problems, uh, there are ways to effectively translate qualitative uh, experiences and values into quantitative terms. And you do it through uh, market analysis. The best way is to look at the things that people actually do with their leisure time as opposed to only looking at the things that we manufacture. Sea Pines Company has done this for many years in our various uh, resort projects from Virginia to Puerto Rico and our, our most widely known venture on Hilton Head Island uh, is, I think, a good example. Most of you, I think, have a, a copy of a brochure of Sea Pines Plantation in your kits. Uh, so you should have a, at least a pictorial feel for what we're all about. But basically, we're 5,000 acres. We've got three activity centers, five miles of beach, three marinas. Uh, one of them is, is uh, a beautiful new little mini town known as uh, uh, Harbor Town. Uh, we've got four golf courses, 30, 40 tennis courts. We've generally been perceived as a pace setter in the field of restricted covenants, height limitations, beachfront treatment, and we've received a, a raft of awards from around uh, the world for it. Uh, a quarter of Sea Pines Plantation is legally dedicated to open space. So what, what do people do at this place, which ostensibly sells real estate, uh, hotel rooms, food, beverage, and, and greens fees? Of the, most, of the ten most popular activities in Sea Pines Plantation, only two of them in the case of property owners and four in the case of resort guests ended up being revenue generators for the company. The most popular activity in Sea Pines, it's not shopping at Harbor Town, it's not consuming elegant cuisine, it's, it's not even playing golf. The most popular activity at our complex is walking on the beach. The second most popular activity is swimming in the ocean. Third is playing golf, a revenue center. Fourth is attending art shows and crafts exhibits. Fifth is riding bicycles. We have 30 miles of bicycles in the plantation. Sixth is going on nature hikes in the forest preserve. Seventh is fishing. Eighth is swimming in pools. Ninth is attending the environmental and history lectures that we give at the Hilton Head Inn. And tenth is playing tennis. And, you know, this is the result of a survey from a, we have about 100,000 people a year that stay with us. You know, this isn't, isn't a tiny uh, exception, exceptional group. The activities for our resort guests, our overnight guests that come down and spend an average of about five days with us was very much uh, the same, except that hiking in the woods and bicycling and fishing and crabbing were, were higher than they were for the property owners. Another indication of what's really important to the public was a survey question that asked resort guests to specify in their own words the things that they'd liked or disliked the most about uh, our project. At the top of the list were not all the ingenious things that we bright young men have created. It wasn't even the wonderful architecture that we have down there. At the top of the list was the natural environment with 56% of all the, all the respondents saying in their own unprompted words that escape to nature, the general natural environment of sea pines is what really prompted them to come there. Number two were the outlets for physical exercise, uh, our recreation facilities, and that was 48%. And in third place, 34% said that they were the most impressed with accommodation, so it appears there is a role for architects in the world. Uh, we said earlier how difficult it is to quantify peace and quiet, to quantify peace and quiet. Number four on the list of things visitor, visitors like most about sea pines was just that, quiet, with 30% saying that was the most important thing to them about their vacation at Sea Pines Plantation. So when you look at it, the marketing analysis, if you ask the right questions and get down to what what's really motivating people gives quite a bit of credence to the perspective of looking at our business at Sea Pines as being providers of access to natural environments. And subsequently, our most important task then is to intelligently manage our environmental resources. 
And I strongly suspect that were similar types of questionnaires and surveys conducted by other members of the leisure industry in their fields, they would come out with very similar results. The, the key difference is evaluating reactions to the experience being bought through the product as opposed to only inquiring about the product itself. Now then, th think about the significance of just what it is that this means. I've outlined hard evidence supported by concrete marketing analysis that the majority of our credit card customers at CPINE specifically identify the God-given environmental assets of our property as the real consumer product obviously in intelligent concert with the supplemental sports diversions we provide and the necessary access services. At Sea Pines, the consumer emphasis is on natural attributes. At places like Williamsburg or San Francisco or, or Orlando, Florida, the emphasis undoubtedly would be on cultural attributes, but still not on room and board or transportation or, or any of the manufactured aspects of the business. At Sea Pines, we know that 50% of, of all the people answering the surveys had been prior guests there before. We, they also said in the same survey that 62% of them would be coming back. So we know that there's an unmistakable uh, acceptance for our product as well as a future demand for it. And we've been, been there for 18 years, as Patrick says. But to accountants, these environmental and cultural products are uneconomic. There are qualitative dimensions that cloud the picture of the economic system. And then to, of course, and perhaps until now, most of us here didn't even perceive sea pines as being in the business of selling quiet, selling walks in the woods and, and selling beautiful views. To most of us, sea pines is a land development company. It's a marketer of hotel, food, golf. So those are two ways of looking at the sea pines business in the leisure industry. The question is, how do the rest of us look at our businesses? Are we selling something that weighs X pounds and takes up so much space, or are we selling basic, instinctual, important needs of man? What are the resources of our businesses and our industry? And what are we and others doing to those resources? Is it right? Is it wrong? What are the real economics of it? If we seriously try tackling some of these questions, we're liable to find ourselves with a new perspective on our firms and on the industry itself. Then if we try adding some ethical, moral, and even religious criteria to the economic evaluation of our performance in the business, we may evolve attitudes that steers clear of conflict with regulatory agencies, as well as avoid ethics arguments with our family members who haven't learned business morality. Now, these are large problems. They're not only the problems of the great gray institution known as business. Uh, it's not that at all. These are really people, human nature types of problems. Each one of us here is a contributor. It's a bum rap to blame shortcomings of society on greedy businessmen, you know, with horns. Uh, what about the lessons that, that today's businessmen learn from previous uh, prior businessmen, and likewise in the future? What about the demands made on parents by the next generation? What about the timidity of our religious institutions while society has been evolving the way it has? These are the problems of all of us, and, and so must the solution be, be the product of all of us. Our leisure industry is, is a, a business of great antiquity. It's founded on the same escape to nature and culture drives that, are, that are, uh, have been with all man and are with us today. It's vitally important that we have that basic understanding because it's, it's very important that we understand we have an equally ancient responsibility to the resources entrusted to us. If we're successful in these pursuits, if we can overcome the obstacles of this era, we'll not only reap a great harvest for our businesses, will not only significantly serve a monumental, truly monumental human need at this time, but we can probably also find for ourselves a degree of satisfaction and peace that's all too rare in the human experience of 1975. I appreciate the chance to share these thoughts with you. Thank you.